I will say I will end at the same, yeah, let's say, position as the speaker before, but I take a totally different path. So enjoy the ride. So artificial intelligence is definitely part of our pop culture. So we all have in mind R2-D2 and Terminator. These are, are the images which come to our mind when we hear that word. But it's also part of our common cultural history. So every civilization on Earth had that idea of creating artificial beings. So it's a kind of an old dream, really, of humanity. And that's the reason why artificial intelligence always has the headlines. That's why we get really emotionally connected to that topic. And have you had two headlines? One is machines will be capable within 20 years of doing any work a man can do. This is the first one. And the second one, in from three to eight years, we will have a machine with the general intelligence of an average human being. Any idea from what year that headline is? So, surprise, surprise, the first one is from 1965, from H.A. Simon, and the second one is from Marvin Minsky in 1970. So, being there, done that, got the t-shirt. So, if you do some analytics and just look on Google Trends, I really was surprised when I saw that the hype in 2004, and that was the farthest way I could go, we are currently at 75% of the level we had in 2004. So how did I get involved in that AI game? In the 80s, I started programming computer games like, like Defender. And we also played a board game at that time, which is called Risk in German, Risiko. It's a game about world domination. And my personal dream was I wanted to create a computer program who was able to beat me in that game. It was a total disaster. I was not able to do that, and it went beyond my programming skill and beyond any technology which has existed in that point in time. So I did my PhD in computer science. I put the score here from ResearchGate, which is a startup here in Berlin. And to give to talk a little bit more on credibility, to compare the numbers, I put here the numbers from Ashwin Ram, who is the leader of Google AI. And of course, he has better numbers than I because he works for Google. But that was not the point. We both worked on an academic field, which was called case-based reasoning which was or is an AI paradigm in building an AI system. And what is case-based reasoning about? Just in two minutes. So you think about you have a problem with your car. It's a new problem, and you have no idea what you need to do. So you go to the guy, which is the repair guy. What is the main difference between you and that guy? Of course, he has more experience. He has seen more cases. He has more knowledge about that. So what does the repair guy then do? OK, he has seen a similar situation. And there is that car who seemed to have a similar problem. He applies that kind of solution to your problem. And of course, he has learned something, problem solved, and the world and your car is getting a little bit better. So that's the idea of, of case-based reasoning. And we built out a company out of that idea in 1991 as a spin-off at the German Research Center of Artificial Intelligence. So as of today, we have about 220 employees, 500 companies out there using it, about 700,000 professional users, and we serve about 40 million customers worldwide. And my bet would be that everyone in the audience had been in touch with our systems without knowing it. So, and then something happened. So, we all had that picture in mind of beating uh, the best player in Go. So, we had the really big advantages in deep learning. And deep learning is a part of artificial intelligence. It's machine learning, 
And the reason why we had that kind of success is because we have a lot of data, we have the hardware, and as mentioned before, all the software is open source. So we've gone a long way to be there. So we started with business intelligence, we had big data as a hype tamer, analytics, machine learning, and now we are at artificial intelligence. And just to make that very clear, we are very well with the topics above, but as of today, standing here on the stage, there is no revolution in artificial intelligence if we think about like general artificial intelligence. But being in that field for a long time, I complete surrender. So artificial intelligence is a marketing word, and I translate it always to machine learning, because that's where we are at that point in time. And for me, artificial intelligence is the new smart. Yeah, we had the smartphone, the smart TV, the smart watch, the smart data, the smart services. So everything really got smart in the last 10 years. And I think the same is happening here with artificial intelligence. So in the next slides, I will use artificial intelligence as a term, but you can always translate it to machine learning. So what is the reason why a lot of people and why, why there really is the hype in the enterprise, why there are so many people interested in that kind of, of technology? And the main reason is that there's so much data out there I want to make sense out of the data. And finally, we'd like to make smarter and better decisions. So that was this report the saying. So what does this mean? As of today, in the enterprise, we have a lot of data. And finally, we want to have actions. So in between, there's a system, and this is here called decision support to analyze the data and make some recommendations. Then usually we have a human who analyzes these kind of recommendations. The human makes a plan. Then he puts his ideas in another system. And finally, yeah, the action is performed. So now we are going to the area of decision automation, which means that the regular business procedures will fly through. And only for the exceptions, we need the humans. What does this mean? So if we look on the problems in the enterprise, and we have the frequency and the complexity of the problems. In the upper left corner, we have problems which occur very frequent, but which are really easy. Down on the right corner, we have problems which occur seldom, but are very complex. As of today, in the blue area, the easy problems we can automate by software. Hard problems will be solved by humans. And in between, there's a big white spot. What do we do in that area? And as of today, mainly human labor is performing these kind of tasks. So if you look on the problems and how often they occur, we have these kind of common problems, which are very often hard problems and something in between, which are the sporadic problems. The common problems, easy cost, we can do that really fast. Hard problems, really complex, we need a lot of work. And the sporadic problems, the some are in the middle. If we multiply that, and this is the workload in an adverse organization, so we see for the common problems, yeah, there is a little chunk, hard problems stay and there are a lot of problems in the middle. And from my point of view, what it, AI is able to do, it can shrink down this blue area. So that if we finally, if we can shrink that area and reduce the effort. So this is supported by a brand new study here from PAC which is called What Can AI Bring yeah, to Business Applications? And finally, our goal is to do something like this, to so have a high automation so that the white area is spotted out and done by machines. So 
if you look at the classic AI applications, they have a proven high business value. They have some advantages, so they provide really good results. They are very comprehensible, but they are very expensive in creating and in maintenance. So we have a kind of very yeah, restricted business application areas, so mainly high volume tasks, a simple reasoning task, and always a well-defined business scenario. So what is the most and successful application in that area? In my view, this is the navigation system. You might not think that this is an AI solution, but finally, it's based on the principle of yeah, let's say Deep Blue is beating Kasparov in chess. So the new application, which are the sub-symbolic ones, have also some advantages. So they have these kinds of superhuman yeah, capabilities. But the disadvantages are reasoning is really difficult and there is no integration yeah, with existing domain knowledge. So there is also a proven high business value, yeah, but also a kind of restricted application areas. You need a lot of massive, or you need a lot of data. You are somehow restricted to these kinds of sensorial tasks. So and finally, is a kind of always this kind of stimulus and response areas. Most successful application is the voice recognition assistance we know as of today. So, if we talk about applying these technologies in the enterprise, what are the killers from my experience in really deploying these kind of technologies? And from my point of view, there are three. And you might be surprised by the last one. So the first one is really data availability. The second one is data quality. And the last one is explainability and comprehensibility. Let's go sh shortly in these topics. The first question is how to obtain these massive data sets. When we go to an enterprise, a lot of people say, OK, there is so much data out there. Why? We just not use it. The reality in most companies as of today is there is not that kind of data we need to have for these approaches. And there is something which I call a paradoxon, because if we talk about humans, then we have a data rich and a knowledge poor environment. So, which means we have a lot of data about all of you, but we don't not understand why you are doing that. So it really, there is the data, but not the knowledge. If you go to the enterprise, and this is fascinating, but it's the opposite. So we have a lot of knowledge why a machine is working, because we have built that machine, but not a lot of data, really labeled data we can use. So, yeah, data acquisition is really the first killer. The second killer is the bias in the algorithms and the data. So, and I don't talk about these ethical questions like Microsoft Tay and women and man. So even if we go, yeah, we bring it down and we really talk about business, there's the same problem. And that's because you have a lot of data about your regular business, which are the penguins. They all look similar. But the real value lies in the exception, which is the red apple in the middle of all these green apples. And if you just let your regular business go, it's really, really difficult to find that data about really that value part of your business. So you always tend to have a bias. Do like as you always done before, which is not really creating value. But the most and the important, the killer question, and I'm sure you didn't expect that 
is the question, are you happy with black box decisions? Because on the one side, all these algorithms work like input, output, the stimulus, response. So can you live with just the result without any explanation? I can. If you think about your braking system, APS, HPS in the car, so you just want your car is stopping as fast as it can, and you don't want to know what's going on. So most managers say, I want to go for the results, and I don't care how we achieve these kind of results. The reality is that it works really fine before you really get in front of court. And you get in front of court, and then you need to explain your decisions. And there is a really a big difference between how these systems work and how we work really with our law. And this is not just one law, it's the question or it's the principle how we as humans have created the law. So there are questions like liability, accountability, responsibility, comprehensibility. If you want to talk to the Workers' Council, and there's always the question if you're in front of court, explain me your decision. Even if it's a wrong decision, tell me why you did that that way. Even if it was wrong, I need to have an explanation. So the final and, from my point of view, most important question is, are you happy with black box decisions and can you defeat that? So this is the question of, of results really versus law. So we have on one side these old and classic sub-symbolic AI algorithms uh, or symbolic algorithms and the new trendy yeah, sub-symbolic algorithms. On the left side, these approaches are data-driven. On, right, on the left side, they are knowledge-driven. On the right side, yeah, they are data-driven. And what's really interesting is if you look at the costs of real deployment of these kind of applications. So because if you are knowledge-driven, you need to put a lot of manual work. It's really expensive to build these kind of applications because you need these kind of authors and experts. If you are data-driven, you the same cost supply. But it's not for creating all this kind of knowledge, but providing all the data and providing the data quality, really, which is needed. So in my point of view, moving forward, we need to have something like these kind of hybrid AI approaches, which, for example, do not fall under this problem with explainability. So you had on the one side the kind of representation, and on the other side, the side of learning, and you need to combine these two. And coming back to case-based reasoning, the case-based reasoning is one of these approaches which is hybrid. Gardner calls this gray box AI, so a combination black box, white box, gray box. So, if really data is the fuel of the 21st century, which I truly believe, then AI is somehow the engine who makes this fuel really powerful. And I put the Gartner hype cycle on the slide, we all know. This hype cycle, in my personal view, we are moving up on the peak of inflated expectations. But I photoshopped it a little bit because it will not go as deep as expected. And the plateau of productivity is really, really close. So in my point of view, artificial intelligence as of today is like Schrodinger's cat. So on one side, it is really that on the side that we think we have these super 
general artificial intelligence who's able to solve every problem we can imagine. So this side is that, but it's alive if you think about an engineering solution which helps us to improve our lives and solve yeah, really big problems of humanity. And just for the geeks, and I don't will go into that if there are any computer scientists out there so they understand. So even for artificial intelligence, the famous question of computer science is, is, still, is still unsolved. I personally never liked KI, Künstliche Intelligenz. And as I said before, I, I hate artificial intelligence as a name because it creates so much emotions. And if we are always in science fiction mode, we are not able to see the reality, exploit the reality, and also work with the problems of reality. And that, I think, is really important because there are so many advantages of AI as a technology that we need to be careful not overdoing that. And that's why I don't like the word KI or AI. And I have my own names for this. So for KI, and this I'm doing for last 10 years, KI is future computer science. Because as seen with navigation systems, you might think this guy is crazy on the stage, but reality in 2000, this was artificial intelligence. That was the edge of technology in 2097. In 97, Deep Blue has beaten Kasparov 2000 navigation systems. So, künftige Informatik is KI. And as I said, I'm ending at the same as my really famous speaker before. AI, for me, is augmented intelligence. If we talk about decisions helping humans to really to make better decisions, having intelligence augmented all over, and that directly goes to the vision that the speaker before has. So thank you very much. I'm perfect in time. And <laughs> if, if you're interested in that topic, we provide a monthly AI newsletter. You can go to our homepage and, sus and subscribe to it. And I'm happy if you follow me on Twitter or on LinkedIn, because there always I post the stuff you might find interesting or not. So thank you very much.